doesn't bother him you know you never hear him complaining he's a uh, collaborative and that's what you look for in any artist you work with what are you doing in acting for 2013 got a lot of stuff going on you know just acting auditioning living life playing poker and enjoying every minute of it he just has a positive attitude he just has a positive outlook he just laughs things off um, and I think it's his way of like always fighting to like hold on to his joy. So we're here at Vice is Nice every year. It's my favorite charity by far. Uh, it's for animal rescue. And I love that 100% of all profits go towards the animals. I myself have a rescue and it's by far the, the one of the best parts of my life. He's been through a lot. And you know, to still carry a smile on his face and be the cheerful guy that you know today is just a blessing. So. He has a hard shell, you know, and this sounds like super cliche, but he's like super loving. This is like my godmother in the poker world, but she's just one of my best friends. I love this woman, love her sense of humor. The only woman to final table the main event ever, still to this day. Poker is great, I love poker. I see people get mad and I just laugh. I go, why, why are you getting mad? Just shake it off, it could always be worse. No matter how bad it gets, it could absolutely always be worse. I think he's honest to a fault. And I think he loves life no matter what took place. And, and I think he doesn't hold grudges. He's got a pair of jacks. Give me your fucking money. <laughs> when I met him, I feel like I'm home. You know what I'm saying? I feel like somebody's very, you, you just get used to him so quickly for some reason. I don't know why. He's been through a lot. You know, life definitely hasn't been easy for him. Um, I'm getting emotional. Uh, I, I feel like I feel like he puts up a front or tells jokes or tries to be the tough guy, but he's a sweetheart. It's something that happened to me so long ago. Are you fine with it all that it's gonna be coming back up again because you've got I, I, I don't know, because I did the show Locked Up Abroad, it, it's constantly thrown back in my face again and I'm constantly having to justify what, uh, uh, in people's words, I claim happened. I think it would be really good closure to tell your story in your own words and then it's almost like you get the last word because you got to tell the truth and I think that's important. At least this way, everyone can kind of see how, how I am and why I am the way I am.
I'm the youngest of, uh, of six boys, no sisters. Uh, Peter's my only full brother. Um, when my mom met my dad, she had Peter and myself, but uh, my, uh, my dad and her just kind of get along and, you know, she painted a really bad picture of my dad, so I didn't really have a, I didn't have a great relationship with my dad. Jeff and Michael were my mom's first two kids. They, uh, they, uh, they, they had it, I don't know, they, they had it kind of bad. There we go. Hey, how are you? I'm good, we finally meet. I feel like I know you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can you tell me your full name and your relationship to Eric? My name is Jeffrey Farneski, and I'm Eric's birth brother. I'm under Michael and above Peter, and then Eric's the youngest. I know you guys were kind of spread out, but if you can tell us what your relationship was like when you were kids. Um, we actually didn't have one. Out of the children that Sherry, our mother, had, I was the only one placed up for adoption. So I actually found out about Eric when I was 18. My mom was a, no, she was young, but she also wasn't a, she wasn't the best idea of a mother, I guess you could say. Hello? Hi, Sherry? Please call me for her, please. Oh, this is Jamie Lynn Lippman. I'm a friend of your son, Eric's, and I'm also a filmmaker. Your name again, please? Jamie Lynn. Hi, Jamie. Hi, how are you? I'm doing very well. Well, I wanted to call you because I'm making a documentary about Eric and I wanted to see about coming out there to interview you. Does Eric know about this? He does. And has he given you permission to speak with me? Yes. Sherry was uh, involved in her own aspirations, and uh, Eric kind of went and did his thing, and I was usually out in the garage. Right before seventh grade, I was uh, I was 12 years old, and uh, Lethal Weapon had come. Lethal Weapon 3 was being filmed up in uh, Lancaster at this old housing track. So Merle brought me there, and he says, Eric, uh, come back in 20 minutes. But I stayed there for a couple hours that night. <laughs> I knew I was going to get in trouble. We saw the aftermath and saw the, the whole movie set, you know, and how things are laid out, how things are done. Uh, and I guess that put the hook in him. Growing up, I liked to watch, uh, you know, Jean-Claude Van Damme movies. Arnold Schwarzenegger movies, and I wanted to be those guys growing up. I wanted to be a, a stuntman my whole life. Tunnel vision, you know, if that's what he wants to do, then yeah, that's what he's going to do. <laughs> he's got his his uh, own set of principles. I was the kind of kid that you kept your kids away from. And I was an asshole, I was a, I was a brat, I was a smart ass, and it's my mouth that got me into a lot of fights. I was not athletic sports-wise, I was terrible. I, I tried basketball, was, I sat at the bench. Um, I didn't play football until I got into high school, but the only reason I wanted to play football, the uh, only reason I wanted to play football is because I like to hit. As a football coach, I'm gonna get a lot of different personalities and, and I'm gonna have the opportunity to work with a lot of different guys, but Eric was always somebody I think that um, um, respected me enough to listen to my advice. And I think that really that really helped us become you know close and to this day we're close friends. To this day I hold a, a, a California record it stood since 1996. Uh, even though I played for a very small school, um, my record of the most tackles by defensive end stands. I had 140, 
seven tackles. Uh, I wanted to play football, but I wanted to act and do stunts even more. And uh, I, was, uh, I was doing little shows when I was still in high school, but uh, the second I turned 18, I, I moved out of the house and I, I, I tried to get down to Hollywood. During this time, I was still auditioning. I was booking some shows here. I booked a big WB show. I was doing Nickelodeon shows. And I was always doing co-stars and small reoccurring. He got so much work, it was crazy. I mean, Eric was very aggressive, and he knew what he wanted, and he would go for it. He would not give up. And he had friends that were directors. He would call them and get parts. I mean, he just loved to be in front of a camera. I met Eric on an episode of Cousin Skeeter. It was a TV show I was doing for Nickelodeon, and he came on as a guest star. And I remember thinking, this guy's crazy. Um, he was just super awesome, full of energy, willing to try and do anything, and we just got really close. Even though, yes, I was starting to become a, a working actor, I still needed a side job to make ends meet, because working as an actor maybe once every month or every other month just doesn't pay the bills. So I always had jobs. I was a security guard, um, and I got asked to be the nighttime manager at a local gym called uh, World Gym in Burbank. He's always talk, you know, he loves to talk. Sometimes I tell him, Eric, hey, you don't know these people. He's like, hey, you gotta practice this and that. You have to know everybody. You know, it's good because you, you never know who you're talking to. So when you're on the front, it's like, a, it's like, it's like, um, it's an easy access or easy victim people to get to get to you. Because you work on the front desk. Anybody can come and talk to you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's how that incident started. Yeah. Wait, Eric, so let me ask you, when's the last time that you came here? Oh, five? I got asked to come here and show somebody the place. So it's now a new gym, correct? Like, it's not the same as it was before, but do the people that had worked there and the owners, did they know everything that happened? I haven't talked to, spoken to any of them since. When you came here in 05, what was it, what was it like? Did it bring back, how, like, how did you feel emotionally? Did it bring uh, back and memories? Was it hard to, did I'm, you go inside? Yeah, I went inside, went downstairs and saw them working out. I'm not the kind of guy who's gonna be like, oh no, this is not where I wanna be in bad memories, I mean, my entire life has not not been a cakewalk, <laughs> so I've been used to this kind of crap, and it's just, if something bad happens, I laugh it off. Okay, well, let's go, um, let's see if we can go in. I became a personal trainer for a lot of the people that came in. I would work, work out with them and teach them how to use the equipment the right way. Uh, a guy named Ray Gazarian was a, an Armenian man in his mid-30s. He had me, he was always paying me to, to work out with him. We were working out four days a week together and I was training him probably nine months. We became very good friends. When you're friends, you're guys. You talk about everything. You talk about girls, you talk about you know the hot girls in the gym, you talk about stupid shit, movies, sports, and something that he had started trying to get me into, which several other people at the gym had been doing themselves, was he would have Young people in their, in, their, in their late teens, early 20s, travel around the world importing expensive leather goods and then paying them for it. And it sounded like a dream job. I'd, I'd never been out of the country. I'd, I'd, I'd only been to a couple different states. But uh, this is, it's all, it's all changed. This living here, uh, it was, all the ellipticals were right here and Ray would usually be right here watching the TVs. It wasn't him who told me about it first though, it was, it was Aura, it was another guy who was making these trips, another young guy who was making these trips, he told me about it. I knew him for, for a long time before I finally went on a trip. And so I had a lot of questions, I asked a lot of questions. Uh, but I saw him as a friend long before I ever decided to work with him. It's oh, unavailable, usually disconnected, or is that? It can be both. Sometimes it can be like they haven't paid their bill. bill yeah, or... it might be a 
it just like a go phone or something? I kind of, let um, me just call back to make sure that I did that right. That and, you know, it so sounded too good to be true. I'm like, is that all you guys are bringing? I said, why, why don't you just mail this stuff back? He says, if I have it mailed back, I have to pay a 55% import tax for them by sending someone over. I save anywhere between thirteen to $14,000. I'm like, well, what happens if they catch you with the leather goods? They're like, will you go to jail for that? He's like, no, it's just a fine. I wasn't convinced though. So my mom put me in touch with one of her friends who worked for the FBI. And, and I, my question to him was, will I go to jail if I get caught doing this? He goes, no, you won't go to jail. It's, but it, it's frowned upon. It, they'll, they'll confiscate it and give you a fine. I said, you won't go to jail? I was like, no, it's like a jaywalking ticket. That's how he explained it to me. And that made my decision. He came over to my mom's house and he was getting ready to go to Turkey. And he was super excited because He's an adventurous person. And he was like, dude, I got this job. Like, I can totally, like, I'm importing leathers and I get to travel and everything's paid for and it's just awesome. And, you know, we were kids, so we didn't think anything. So we just thought, like, wow, this is amazing. And he's like, you want to come? And I'm like, hell yeah, I want to come. At the time, I was working, so I couldn't go. But I remember just being really excited for him that he had found this other job besides working at the gym. He was my last child, and the day that I had him, I never had one contraction, not one. He let me know he was coming, and 45 minutes later, he was born. He's always been pretty inquisitive, um, but between school, football, movie industry, cars, Helping other people. I think I overprotected him. I wished I'd let him go out and learn the world, but I didn't want him to get hurt. So he was right picking for a wolf in sheep's clothing. You never think something like this could ever happen to, to anyone. It only happens in the movies. It doesn't happen to people in real life. But uh, I learned the I learned the hard way that uh, I learned the hard way that uh, this stuff does happen, and it would uh, it would it would cost cost me more than than I could ever imagine. I would go to jail for a crime I didn't commit, and I would come out a murderer. So there's so much to see in Turkey. Turkey's a beautiful country. Istanbul's just amazing. And I was there for a few days. I felt big, I didn't feel small anymore because I was, ex I was experiencing life. Traveling is amazing and I love it. Now when I landed in Stockholm, they had a drug sniffing dog sniffing everyone's bags. Uh, the dog pulled me out. But it was but it wasn't just pulling me out, it pulled out it was pulling people out at random. My imagination was like I I got screwed. I got screwed. This is uh broke down palace, you know, it was midnight express. They went through everything, all the jackets, found nothing. Everything was fine. And they were like, alright, you're good to go. I was like, okay. So now I was like, all right, this is the most legit job ever. Ray was there waiting for me, picked me up from the airport. The whole way to my house, he was telling me, see, did you have a great time? Had a great time. He's like, what'd you do? And I was telling him about my trip. When we got to, uh, to my apartment, we brought the leather cases in and I showed him everything and it, it, it all seemed copacetic. He was happy with, with everything and uh, he paid me $800 right there. And I thought, wow, this is the best job ever. He asked me, when can I go again? He wanted me to go literally like in the next, uh, next month. I started filming the movie, The Scorpion King, and I was working on that movie as a, as a stuntman. So I said, I can't, I'm working on a, on a, on a movie. And I was, uh, I was getting a lot of acting jobs at this time, but I wanted to keep this opportunity open. I didn't want to lose it. I, I wanted to go on more trips in the future. So what I started to do was encourage this job to everyone 
uh, to my friends, my family. Hell, I even I even encouraged it to my mother. Yeah, he told all of us about it. Um, I knew about it. My girlfriend at the time knew about it. Um, our brother Michael knew about it. His wife. Everybody knew. Um, this was a guy that was at his gym. He used to train him. Um, you know, Ray was a buddy of his. We all heard about him. September 11th happens. And uh, it was a big wake-up call for uh, America. And no one wanted to go on any trips, understandably. No one wanted to go on any trips anymore. My brother Peter, when I told him about these trips, he, he, he actually reached out to me. He wanted to go on one of these trips. And he says, yeah, I could absolutely use $800. That'd be awesome. So I set him up with Ray. I get a call from Ray. He tells me, hey, Peter says he's not going. And I put a lot of money into this. It's, it's putting me in a really bad spot. You need to talk to him. I said, all right, I'll, you know, I'll call him because this is making me look bad. Here I vouched for Peter and he's backing out and I didn't understand why. So I call Peter and he just matter of fact, he goes, yeah, Eric, Eric, I'm not going. And he wasn't explaining why he wasn't going. I'm like, why? Well, Peter, you're making me look like a, a dick. He's like, he's like, well, I'm not going over there. It's just, it's just not gonna happen. I go, why? He goes, it's dangerous. And I tell him, you have nothing to worry about, man. Turkey's a great country. It's not, it's, it's not to Turkey, it's to Pakistan. I said, what are you talking about? Because yeah, Ray's saying it's to Pakistan. I'm not going to Pakistan. And now I, could, I agreed with Peter. I agreed with Peter. I said, no, you're not going to Pakistan. I, I, can't, I can vouch for Turkey because I've been there twice now, but I've never been to Pakistan, so I can't vouch for Pakistan. So I call Ray and I go, what the hell's going on? Peter's saying it's to Pakistan? He goes, yeah, I've got a really good deal over there. I was like, whoa, no, who? Well, you didn't tell me it's to Pakistan. Yeah, Peter doesn't want to go. He goes, look, I've already set everything up. I spent a lot of money on this. If your brother backs out now, I'm gonna lose a lot of money. Ray started making me feel really bad and Peter wasn't gonna go. He didn't wanna go, he had his mind set up. And I didn't wanna let my friend Ray down. So even though I had no time, I had no time, I took the trip. I took the trip and I'm glad I did. I'm glad what was about to happen to me would, would happen to me rather than someone else because of me. walk out of the airport to where you know all the visitors are and there's this there's a guy there with a napkin that has my name written on it he says to me right then and there he goes hey man Ray Ray messed up I go what do you mean he messed up he goes you were supposed to come to Karachi I go okay where's that Karachi's eight hours drive south of Islamabad I'm in Islamabad and Karachi is you know a couple hour flight from Islamabad so I said what does that mean it goes means that we got to go down there, I go, am I coming with you? Like, no, we're gonna put you up in a hotel up here. And uh, first off, they're telling me, by the way, you don't wanna leave the hotel. I'm like, why? They said, because they don't like Westerners here. I'm like, what? <laughs> first off, don't tell me that, because I'm not staying in a room for a week. That's not an all an option. And uh, I, I decided to do what I do. I put on my jogging shorts, my, my backpack and my tank top, and I went jogging through the streets of, uh, of uh, Islamabad. evil faces, so many angry stares, but I would just smile and wave and just, hey, just keep going because, you know, you want to, you don't want to look mad dog people back, you know, I don't want them to think I'm dangerous or anything. I want them to know I'm friendly and hopefully they'll be friendly towards me. But I don't talk to anyone and I, I find an internet cafe just to, you know, see who's emailed me and there's one email that jumps out and it's an email from Missy. It wasn't to me, but it was a group email telling me that her mother had died from cancer. What happened at that time? 
him. I remember sending out the email. He wrote back. He said, I believe he said something like, I'm so sorry, I love you, I'll be home soon. And when he had sent you that email, was there, uh, I think on his end, the hope of him coming back and maybe restarting that again or seeing where this could go? Yeah, that was definitely something that was on the table at that point. Missy was my motivation in life for so many different things. She was the reason I, I worked out harder, the reason I studied longer, the reason I wanted to be very successful as an actor, just so I could be on her radar. That night I go back to the hotel. I can't wait to get on the flight. I have an early morning flight, it's around 6 a.m. I get a call from downstairs that uh, uh, one of the guys are here to pick me up and they want me to come downstairs. That's not how it's ever worked in Turkey though. They'd always you know, come upstairs, let me go through everything. I have to grade it. Guy brings up one suitcase, only one suitcase. So I call Ray, I call Ray immediately from the hotel and I say, hey Ray, um, is this right? I tell him it's one suitcase, it's seven pieces. He goes, yeah, that's right. It's just, it's a first trip. We wanna see how it goes. Instead of like being concerned, I'm actually kind of happy. I'm like, cool, I don't have to carry all this luggage anymore. I'm not gonna have to pay money at the, at the airport because it's not that heavy. So I'm kind of relieved, like, all right, cool. It's just one suitcase, at least that's nice. And I take the suitcase and I take my bag, get up to the line for international uh, departures, and I'm probably six inches taller than the next person. Pakistani people are very tiny. And this is the long line. As soon as I get around the corner, because there, there's customs up there, uh, a customs officer sees me and waves me to the front. I'm like, yes, all right, it pays to be a foreigner. I go and I skip this long line. I'll go up to the front, and I'm about to go to the metal detectors. Um, when someone grabs my arm, I turn around, and this another guy comes up and says, are you carrying narcotics? I said, check it again. Takes the suitcase, only my suitcase, not my backpack, not my bag. Opens it up and throws all the leather jackets and clothes onto the floor. Now I'm pissed, I'm like, whoa, 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 well that's what I'm here for, what the fuck? Takes the suitcase, goes to another room, goes someplace else. I start folding up all the clothes and everything and uh, a guard takes me, asks me to follow him. I follow him while I'm folding up all the stuff. He comes back into the room, followed by a guard who's in uniform, holding two two thin sealed patches and he says what is this i said he's holding it meaning like he's the one who's holding it so he should know what it is because this is all film i said why are you showing me this he says it came out of your luggage I got a phone call from the American Embassy in Islamabad, Pakistan, saying that my son Eric had been arrested for drug smuggling and he was facing death by hanging. And I'm going, no, no. You know, we Americans are so innocent, so naive, so protected. And I'm going, no, no. Here, I got this number, it's Frank, it's Frank Azarian, he hired him, you know, I just. <laughs> Let myself in, called up, says, hey, sure, I'm here. Go in, I see all these maps, I'm Pakistan, Afghanistan. And she comes down, says, what do you think of that? I says, what do I think? What do you have these on your table for? She goes, Eric's in prison. And it's just like, you know, someone comes up and goes, boom, right in the chest. Cool. I sit down and get back up and I'm like, what? She goes, Eric's in prison for drug smuggling. And I, I, I think I just looked at her for a while. You know, kind of like puppy dog, crook your head, like, <laughs> okay, where are the cameras? And when's this joke gonna be over?
I got hit in the head by a rifle and I got dragged off to a customs lockup. And I know I'm innocent. I know a lot of people know I'm innocent. So I'm thinking th 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 this is gonna blow over once they know I'm innocent. I'm gonna be out of here maybe a couple days. I, there's no way they're gonna keep me here. So I'm taking photos and I'm, I'm posing for these photos because this is, it's a fucking joke in my eyes. There's no way they're gonna keep me here because innocent people don't fucking stay in bad situations like that. They just don't. That's how I, that's what I believed. The embassy consular, this girl named Christy Agor, tells me that they're gonna put me in front of um, a lower court magistrate who's gonna decide how many days of physical remand I get. And I go, what does that even mean? She goes, well, here in Pakistan, they have something called physical remand. It's where they think that by beating you, you're gonna tell them the truth. The customs, uh police came and got me and took me in a vehicle to another part of town, maybe only 20, 30 minutes away. Christy comes forward and starts talking to the judge in Urdu. So as we're walking away, she's telling me quickly what happened. I go, what happened? She goes, the judge wanted 10 days. I got you three. on is uh, we're preparing for flashback scenes for this documentary. Uh, Jamie wants to Jamie wants to recreate as much as possible. Um, we got a talented actor uh, to play me. I I don't play 21 anymore, and even if I could, I I wouldn't want to do this again. It's just gonna be a fun two days of uh, awesome memories. Assalamu alaikum. What's your name? Eric Day. How old are you, Mr. Ode? 21. Where are you from? America. You do know that I've been asked these questions already, right? And what is it that you do in America? I'm an actor. Actor? Hollywood. Who gave you the drugs, Mr. Actor? I didn't get any drugs. <laughs> Again. 
Who gave you the drugs? Nobody. I didn't get any drugs. I'm telling you. I'm innocent. I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth. I'm innocent. I'm telling you everything I know. I'm telling you, I'm innocent. Everyone starts out saying that. So, Mr. Cody, where did you buy the drugs from? I didn't get any drugs. I'm telling you the truth. You don't have to do that. I'll tell you everything I know. I'm, I've told you everything. There's nothing else for me to say. I'm telling you the, the truth. truth. Please, I'm telling you the truth. Please, please. Fuck! Please, please! I'm telling you the truth! I don't know anything else! Fuck! I need you to listen to me. This guy sent me here to pick up some leather goods for him and bring them back. That's all I know. I don't... I don't know anything about any drugs, I swear to you. I swear to God. You know, I've never tortured a Hollywood movie star before. I'm going to enjoy this. Please. Who gave you the drugs? <laughs> Give me names, please, the numbers, phone numbers, numbers, address. Ray, Ray Gazarian, Ray Gazarian. Gay Ga Gazarian, what does he mean? I don't, I don't know, okay? I, Los Angeles. I need a name in Pakistan, an address, a phone number. I don't have an address at the, ho the hotel. The How do you look like? Was he tall, short? He looked fucking Pakistani. Pakistani Give yes. me a phone number. I don't. Sure. I, I don't. Kumara. Banjore? Banjore? Ah! Amriki? America? Eh? Harame, I can't Harame. tell you what. No! no! Chalo maza de teha. Nietzsche. Nietzsche. Because I'm innocent, I had no right answers for them. So... 
so nothing I say is going to make them stop. That sick son of a bitch upstairs, who some of us call God, it's like he's been preparing me my whole life for this situation. Just months before, the show Fear Factor had come out, and the first episode I ever watched, the person who won $50,000 won because he could hold his breath for a minute and 13 seconds. After I saw that episode, I said, you know what, I'm gonna go get myself to, on Fear Factor. And so I would practice at night to hold my breath. I would hold my breath when I got in the shower when I was at a stoplight before I went to bed. And I got it to where I could hold my breath almost three minutes. Now here I am being dunked by these guys. And they're keeping me under at least a minute, minute and a half. And I didn't want them to know how easy it was for me. But I'm thinking to myself, wow, had I not seen that damn show, I would be in a lot of trouble right now. Do you have anything you wish to tell me? You're torturing an innocent man. Hollywood. Just admit the drugs are yours, honey. This will be over. No. Eric had the physique. He had the discipline. He had the pain tolerance. Because of Eric's bus accident, he learn to deal with pain, because Eric lives in pain every day. I was run over by a school bus. I was eight years old, and the two back rear tires ran over my, uh, my, my pelvis. 
it shattered my pelvis like a glass jar. I, uh, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be able to walk again for a couple years. When I got home from the hospital, I had these the, the worst kidney pains. I started feeling bad for being such a nuisance to everyone when I screamed because they couldn't do anything for me. So I would start to, I would start to force myself to scream in silence. He got the beatings on the hand where his hands are like permanently broken. Um, I know he said he got beatings on the feet, has scars all over his feet. I, I wouldn't have lasted. I know that. I, I don't know. I mean, I just remember feeling just like, uh, uh, just feeling really empty, you know, and, and, and saying, you know, how the hell? I mean, what do you do? I remember thinking like, you know, like that can't be possible. Like my understanding of other countries at that time, it was like textbook or what you see in the news. You don't see it happening to someone that you know. It's just unbelievable what, 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 what goes on. You don't think this shit really happens. You watch a movie and you're like, wow, it's a bad scene, but this shit really happens. And it happened to me. I was getting tortured. I got tortured. And it, you know, it's, it's painful, but it's more emotionally painful than physically. It, it, it is. And, and I hate thinking about it. I, 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 uh, When I finally got uh, brought to, I, I, once I got brought back, I got brought back to the customs lockup and the Christie came again and they let me use a cell phone to call my mom to see, to let her know how I was doing and everything. I didn't tell her anything. I, I just said, hey, everything's fine. Everything's fine. What's going on on your end? She's trying to get lawyers. She's trying to figure out, you know, she's contacted the police. They're trying to find Ray. They can't find him. And that's what's confusing me is I don't understand why they can't find Ray. It should be very easy. They got a cell phone. They, you know, he shouldn't be too hard to find. Everyone knew him. Everyone knew him. Ray Kazarian. That's all I know. Ray Kazarian. Well, one of the reporters that was there, I forget which newspaper he worked for, but later on that day, somebody from the office called me, and he says, I think you got the wrong person. And I said, what do you mean? Because I also gave out the phone numbers that I had. Well, the cell phone was, of course, you know, dead. It was no longer good. And, of course, the office phone was disconnected, but it still can be traced. So they did a reverse directory on that number. So I called, and I said, may I speak to Ray Kazarian? He says, speaking. And I said, are you Ray Kazarian Jr.? Because you're not the Ray Kazarian I want to talk to. And he says, what's going on? Are you guys trying to sell me newspapers or what? And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, when the first guy called asking for me, he, doesn't he work for some newspaper? Now what, you want me to buy a subscription or what? And I said, no, sir, I don't. Let me tell you a story. And told him what he had done to my son. He says, um, I know who set your son up. And I said, Ray Kazarian. And he says, no. His name isn't Ray Kazarian. His name is Raz McManessian. M-E-N-A-S-I-A-N, Raz McManessian. Let's see what comes up here. Oh my god. Oh my god, that that's him? him, yeah. Which one? That's him. Oh, I gotta send him a message, okay. Oh, maybe we should go to, if he has a LinkedIn. It's LinkedIn. The next day, I'm driven to Rawalpindi. Rawalpindi uh, was home to the biggest prison in all of Pakistan. It was uh, called Central Jail Adiala. They have these prisoners inside the prison who police the prisoners. They're called number darts, and they're giving me a welcoming wagon. Now, their horseshoe around the door, I, don't know, I always say it was like 10 or 12 of them. But the reason they're horseshoe around the door is so that, you know, they can corral you and everything. 
And the guards think it's funny. They take bets. They think it's funny who's gonna do what to who. This is just part of the way it is in Pakistan. So when the guard starts looking at me, he's like this, you know, hey, get ready, you're gonna fight. And it's like if you're not, like one of the biggest messages from any prison movie or show you ever watch is if you go in weak, you're gonna be somebody's bitch. So I got in that game frame. This is opening kickoff. I'm Eric all day, odd day, the meanest motherfucker up in this motherfucker. Let's dance. I'm dropping them. I'm body slamming these guys. No one at all came close to fucking me up that day when I first got in there. This little guy who works, he's a Mashakti. Mashakti is a prison worker, not a number dart. He lets me know he wants me to follow him and we go off into the prison. I get up to go lay down where like a, like a bunch of blankets are and I just, I just, I just want to sleep, but someone says to me, uh, American? I'm like, nope, Pakistan, born and raised, raised right down the road here. Been here my whole life. The guy's like, no, you're the American. He shows me, shows me the front page of a newspaper article, and sure enough, there's my dickhead ass, and I was smiling for the cameras. So now I'm in another fight, and this time I'm getting my ass handed to me. I'm losing this fight, there's just too many. And this guy was on my back, like just scratching me off, that I threw him off the balcony onto a crowd below. I threw him onto a crowd. And well, the guards ran up to the, the stairs and started baton charging and hitting me with their batons. I got brought, I got dragged to a place in prison called Kasori. I would spend the first five days in jail in Kasori. Kasori is, it, it's, not a, it's not a prison sized room, it's like a closet. Once a day, every day, I would have the bottom of my feet beat. Uh, I would spend the total of 132 days of the three years that I would remain in this prison in that room. Um, the longest I, uh, I spent in Kasori in a row was eight weeks. The things that you think about when you're in Kasori are, uh, you start to learn how to remember things you thought you forgot. You know, how you took shortcuts home from school when you were a kid, or I, 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 I made up songs, I, I, I relived uh, scenarios in my life, I watched movies in my head. I, uh, I thought, about, uh, thought about the days I'd get out and get my hands around Ray's neck. Um, thought about Missy a lot. You know, whatever, just, you just, you just think, it's all you can do. In the beginning, there was a lot of high hopes for, you know, him coming home and us being able to have a relationship and a, a lot of different things happening and you just we couldn't have anticipated things happening the way that they did. I don't think anyone can. Mm -hmm. And were you aware of what was happening to him while he was in the prison and the torture? And Eric didn't tell me a lot. I think he just didn't want to worry me. And he'd tell his mom not to tell me things, but Sherry would tell me some stuff anyway. So I was aware to a point. Um, I don't think I ever had the full picture of it at that time. But Eric always tried to paint a happier picture for me. I did not know the, the extent of, of what he was experiencing when he first got there. And I think that was a conscious choice for him not to share it with me because me being upset or crying on the phone was not going to help him needing to hear positivity and hope and someone to have a positive outlook and tell him, like, dude, you're coming back. Like, we all know it. We're all believing it. I'll see you soon. I couldn't be in general population because some asshole put a, a, a 5,000 rupee bounty on my head. And uh, when someone ever asked me, hey, what's your life worth? I know exactly what my life's worth. My, my life is worth $87. So my job was to keep his spirits up, keep him fed, keep him alive, keep, keep the um, news media on him because as long as I could keep his name out there, Pakistan was not about to do anything to him because the world was watching. She was a wreck. 
Yeah, she was. She didn't. She, she wanted to go over there and get him out, but of course she can't. Uh, but she just would call, um, you know, the senator and people that she thought could help him get out. Uh, we would do walks to try to get him out. Um, she had yard sales to collect money to send him money because he needed money and food, to, you know, to buy. Um, and I know that she just would do anything to get her son out of that prison. A superintendent came to the prison and, and said, hey, the, the, the safest place for us to put uh, this guy is on death row. Um, I got put in a, uh, my own cell on death row, which is a luxury. Having your own cell is a luxury. And there's no beds. You sleep on the floor. You have one squat toilet. You wipe your ass with your hand and then wash your hand off. There's no toilet paper. It's just, that's how it is. Um, and these rooms are covered with cockroaches. They're covered with mosquitoes, uh, spiders. Uh, the elements are, are there for, for the wind to come in sideways and, and dust going in. Uh, when it rains, the cells fill up and uh, rats will, will start to swim around. The first few months were really terrible because I was, uh, I was hungry, I was starving. I'm literally twice the size of everyone around me, and I was getting the same amount of food as all of them. So I was always hungry. And if you want to eat more, you have to have money and buy from the outside cantinas or, or bribe the guards to go out and get it for you. But I have no way to communicate other than literally from like the first few weeks, I started realizing that I need to understand these people because no, one, no one's able to understand me. Um, what I would do is I would tear pieces of uh, paper into uh, sections and fold them up and I would start writing uh, the words uh, in, in Urdu and the way that they're written, the way they sound, and I was learning anywhere from 20 to 40 words a day. Because he was uh, somebody that could just pick up a book and teach himself, and I think that that helped him too. Other people started to respect him more when he learned their language. In the room just next to me was a man named uh, Murad. Murad could speak a little bit of English. Uh, he was very friendly to me, offered me lunch, breakfast. Um, he was the only one that spoke any English, so him and I would become, we would become very good friends. We, we would become best friends in prison. He was on death row for killing 11 of his wife's family members. And uh, it sounds awful, and it is. In Pakistan, you're told who you're gonna marry. And uh, Murad and his uh, wife fell in love on their own and they had to run away to, to, to be together. And they, they ran away and got married. Well, while they ran away, both their families were feuding and fighting. Um, they were killing each other. They were accusing one another of, uh, of hiding the couple. Well, what brought him out of hiding was uh, his wife's family members um, kidnapped his mother and his sister and uh, they, uh, they gang raped him and uh, murdered him by having their, uh, their breasts cut off and let him bleed to death. So Murad ambushed his wife's family members, killing 11 of them. But in jail, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't, you know, he was very kind to me. And he introduced me to the game of the Texas Hold'em Poker. The first time I ever uh, picked up a hand of poker was on death row in Pakistan. When you play all the time, you start to learn how to read people. It doesn't matter what language they speak or, or anything, but when people are scared, it shows the same. Uh, regardless of uh, what nationality they are. Hardly any of the politicians wanted to get involved. I was pretty much on my own. I was spending, like I said, I, I slept maybe an hour a day because I felt like I was in a maze, you know, because so many doors were being closed, but I had to keep going. You know when you have like this deep, uh, you know, like deep inside you, he's coming back. And sometimes, you know, the other mind told you, wake up. This is a cold case in Pakistan. It's not gonna happen. And you're like going back and forth with your head like a crazy man. 
it's the same thing. You know, it, it, on the other side, you're like, you know, all these people, you know, sending letters, people calling. There is a hope, you know, that is somebody will do something. So that's the only thing it's making me like have a huge hope he's coming back. On the other hand, I look at the case. Until the guy got arrested. Roughly six months after I was in jail, a DEA agent comes and he shows me two photos and asks me, do I recognize anyone in these photos? I immediately picked out Ray. I was like, that's Ray. He goes, well, his name is Raz McManassian. And this is where I would find out that he had been using an alias the whole time. And I'm like, all right, cool. How did you guys get him? What had happened was a Swedish woman was traveling in from JFK airport doing the same thing I was doing, but she lost her luggage at JFK. So she continued on her itinerary to LAX. They found the drugs in the walls of her suitcase, built professionally into the suitcase. And what they did is they arrested both her and the man that I had known as Ray Gazarian, except he posted bail under the name Raz McManassian. My mom's private investigator hears about this, brings it to the attention of the DEA, saying, hey, look, this sounds a lot like this guy who set up Eric. So they re-arrest him, deny him bail. They let the Swedish girl go back to her country without being charged in less than two weeks, simply because her story matched mine and several others. So when I heard about this, I felt great. I'm like, all right, great. Someone's not in jail because of me. That's awesome. I felt good about that. So now, now here I got the DEA guy telling me this story and I'm, t I'm asking, all right, so what happens now? Uh, what are you guys doing to get me out of here? And I could tell by his expression that he just felt really bad. And I'm like, what's, what, what, what's going on? He says, I've never seen this before. I go, what do you mean? He goes, I've never actually met someone who's innocent. They let her go home and arrested him. But nobody would do anything to help me get Eric home. He goes, if this had been done in America, you'd be going home tonight. Because it's done here in Pakistan, you still have to go through the legal system here. So it sucked being in jail for something I didn't do and no one believed in me, but it, it, believe it or not, it sucks a lot worse when people actually believe you and the people you assumed could do, and the people that you know that can do something about it believe you but choose to not do anything about it. Yeah, no, that's great. Okay, so I need to ask you, so what was the involvement with your friend that was the PI? Can we call him and see? Yeah, yeah okay. let's, just, let's just see. So, Eddie, my question is, so if I, I really want to interview Ray, but I'm having a really hard time tracking him down. Like, I have a phone number that's disconnected. I found an address on the internet that could be his. Um, I found a bunch of businesses that he used to have that seemed to all dissolve and all those numbers are disconnected. I sent him a message, I found him on Facebook, but we're not connected so he hasn't seen the message yet. But we're kind of in the end and I really, if I, if, there, if how I can go about finding either an address, an email, a phone number. If you have uh, either his home, name, and middle initial, or a social security number, or a former address. I can, uh, I can find out where he is now. Okay. A former address. A former address. What if it was an old biz? What if it was an old business address or one that he used for a business? Would that work? Yeah, that work. And it probably would take about an hour to get the uh, you know complete background on it. Some of the superintendents started liking me. Uh, one, one in particular was a man named Ayub. He's the one who would introduce me to the Palestinian hijackers. The hijacking of Pan Am Flight 73 is over, but the cost has been very high. Many passengers who were on board the plane are in shock. Many have been wounded in the final orgy of violence. And some passengers, plus two of the hijackers, have been killed. These guys were happy that their plan had failed because their, their mission was to kill themselves and kill everyone on board that plane. Uh, what did happen though is their actions led to 23 people being killed. And the first person I meet is Fahad. Fahad was the youngest and by this time, he's in his 30s. He's in his 30s, he's just big man. He's wearing a big muumuu. The hijackers are celebrities in here. I'm a celebrity in here. Um, the, the future prime minister of Pakistan is up in A class. His name's Yusuf Jelani. He's a, he's a celebrity in there. And then you've got political officials, but there's really only a few of us who everyone knows of. So I, I somehow become friends with these guys. Um, they, they, order, like they make food for us. We sit around, we drink, we drink uh, Pepsi and some sweet dish that they just happen to have. And their rooms are really nice, actually. Like, 
There's carpet on the floor. They just, they prayed, they ate food, and they tried to get through each day as easily as possible. When I got moved nine and a half months later from death row to two cell, I was able to socialize with these guys more, go have breakfast and lunch with them, and uh, swap books over the wall. But one thing that the hijackers had, which is a big deal, is they had connections with the guard. The guards wouldn't search the room. The hijackers were left alone and they had a lot of clout. They had something that I definitely needed. Let me ask you, how did you get a camera inside prison? Uh, I got a camera into the prison because uh, one of the hijackers, Fahad, got it, got it in for me. I wanted to take some photos and he got it in. Like what would have happened if they found, like people don't have cameras in prison, do they? People aren't supposed to have a lot of things in prison, and but we have them. If you get caught with them, you get in trouble. Simple. Getting in trouble is beat, punished, thrown in kasori, uh, privileges taken away. But how do you get them? You actually just pay people on the outside. Yeah, people, guards smuggle things in, uh, religious teachers smuggle things in, prisoners smuggle things in, the canteen smuggles things in. You can. It, it, Guys throw things over the wall. Hell, fuck, if we had drones back in the day, you'd see drones dropping things left and right. Wow, that's amazing. I'm glad I got some photos. I had the camera, I think, for two, maybe three days. And that's what I was able to get in those two or three days. It started with food. Well, then it got to things bigger. Hey, I'll give you a thousand rupees for a cell phone. Guy brings me a cell phone. I'm able to find a signal in, in the corner of my room. And at night, I'm able to communicate with my family, my friends. The first time I got to talk to Eric, first of all, I was blown, because I was like, how the hell did you get a cell phone? Um, and then at the same token, I was like, of course, it's you, it's Eric. You know, and we talked about um, how he had made friends with some people in there. We talked about initially how it was super, super, super hard, um, kind of being the American, so to speak. Uh, we talked about how he learned different languages how he cultivated relationships, how he was able to get some DVDs and movies that I had done that he had watched. Um, and, it, and it just was good, you know? And we still just believed that, you know, eventually he would come home, so. During this whole time, I'm still learning the language. I'm still learning Urdu. Um, and I'm also trying to work on my case. I had finally gotten a lawyer who was a, just a piece of shit lawyer to agree to take my case for $2,000, which is still five times more than anyone else would have paid, but it's a lot less than what a lot of lawyers were asking me for. And uh, I would go back and forth to court so many times, but nothing would happen. Either the judge wouldn't show up, uh, the prosecutor wouldn't show up, my own lawyer wouldn't show up. What we needed for the courts is we needed Raz McManessian to sign a statement stating that he never told Eric about the drugs. And that might do some, you know, do some good. Well, I had found out where he lived. And I found out he had two kids. And I'm not a vindictive woman, but I was fighting for my son. I wrote him a letter. And I told him how Eric couldn't believe that his friend Ray would do this to him. I mean, Ray was his friend. He was just in shock. And I wrote in there how Eric was being starved and tortured and beaten and, you know. I said, he can't believe you would do this to him. And then I went on and I said how, you know, maybe if he would confess, that, that maybe, you know, the courts would look at that and grant Eric clemency. clemency. Then I went one step further, and I'm ashamed of it, but I had to do it. I said, I know you're surprised that we found you, because we know you as Ray Gazarian. But now that I know you're Raz McManessian, what would you do if somebody was going to hurt your son or daughter? Think about it. He signed an affidavit stating that I was absolutely unknowing. So I go to court January 3rd, and the lady says to me, Eric, 
This is what's gonna happen. The judge is gonna give you a two year prison sentence. We're gonna pay him $1,000 through your account. It's already in your account. Um, and with good behavior, you'll probably be going home in a couple months. I said, this is great, this is great news. Whoa, that's awesome. They go, okay. All you have to do though is plead guilty. At that time, at that moment, I didn't know, I didn't know what I was gonna do. What solidified my choice was what Avzal, the interpreter from the embassy said. He, he, he stands next to me and he goes, Eric, what's worth more to you, your pride or your freedom? And I remember looking at him and I was like, you little bastard. <laughs> because that made me ask myself that question. What is worth more to me? My pride or my freedom? And there was no hesitation. My pride is worth a hell of a lot more to me than my freedom. At the end of the day, I gotta look at myself in the mirror and if I get out of prison, I'm gonna end up killing myself 100% from just shame of going around pleading guilty for some shit I didn't fucking do. Yeah, it's Pakistan. But yes, my pride is worth a hell of a, hell of a lot more to me than my freedom. When I got presented back in that room that day, the judge uh, asked me if I wished to change my plea. And I told him, no, not guilty. I went into Eric's room and I opened his closet. And I wanted to smell my son. And I held all his clothes and there wasn't any smell. And I didn't know I had collapsed to the floor. And I heard this animal howling. <laughs> then you could tell the animal was, was in pain. I mean, absolute pain. And I realized it was me. Hello? Hi, can I please speak with Razmik? He's not here, mask is coming. Uh, my name is Jamie Lynn uh, Lippman, and I'm a do documentary filmmaker, and I wanted to talk to him about being part of a project that I'm making. Okay, he's not here. Uh, can I, is there a better time that I could call back to reach him, or does he have a cell phone number? Uh, maybe around 6 o'clock. Call him at 6 o'clock? Okay, should I leave my information with you, or should I try him back? Uh, I can take your phone number, sure. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Hold on one moment. The very next morning, I went and called my mom. And I said, Mom, look, I already know what I'm going to do for the high court. And I tried to tell her my plan for the high court, and she had already cut me off. She said that she already had a lawyer lined up for me, that this guy was one of the best. He came, he came highly recommended. She was so confident over the phone, I said, I gave her, the, gave her my blessing, go ahead, go with this guy. Originally, my mother told me that he took the case pro bono. A couple months go by, and uh, I, I finally asked my mom, I go, Mom, what's, what's going on with my case? The hijackers, they say, hey, look, we have a lawyer that we would like to recommend. It's the same lawyer that represented us for our case. Seven months after I'd been sentenced, we threw ourselves at the mercy of the court to hopefully show leniency. They did. They gave me a second chance at the high court. But what it should have been done seven months previous was being done seven months later. Um, well, because of the amount of cases that were gonna be shown at high court, it wouldn't be for another year and four months before my case would finally get heard. Before that would happen though, I would take one of the worst beatings I've ever taken in my life. We had a, uh, we had a guard, his name was, his, he was nicknamed Goldleaf. And uh, Goldleaf is uh, the name of a cigarette brand in Pakistan. It was rumored that he 
was responsible for the death of hundreds of prisoners since that prison had opened up in 1986 who either couldn't afford to buy on gold leaf cigarettes or just flat out refused to. I had been dealing with these uh, severe earaches ever since monsoon season had happened my first year there. The, the, the cockroaches would come out of their, their hiding places in masses and crawl all over you. You would get mosquitoes uh, biting every uh, open inch of you. And you would sleep in the water. And I would, I would literally think about suicide all the time because of my ears, not because of being, being in this situation or being alone or, or being sad or feeling sorry for myself, but because I was in so much pain that I thought, hey, if I kill myself, it wouldn't be, it, it would be humane. Well, Goldleaf, he calls America a bunch of, he calls America a bunch of female dogs. And uh, then he says to me, give me 500 rupees but I'm in so much damn pain, I, I just don't want to be fucked with by this guy. So I tell him in his own language, I say, hey, we, we, may be all, we may all be dogs, but you're a little bitch. And he just, he, he didn't like that at all. He didn't like that at all. So he fumbles with his keys and goes to open the cell door. And when he came in, I mean, this guy's like 5'3". He goes in to hit me with his cane and I, I grabbed him and, I, and started punching him with his own hand. And then I just lost it. I was in so much pain, I just wanted to die. At least this way, it wasn't gonna be suicide, but I was gonna make these guys earn it. So that day, I absolutely planned on dying. I had a couple of my ribs broken, my left shoulder was collapsed, my left eye was just was just closed up. Uh, they held out my hand and broke each one of my fingers one by one. And uh, when they started on my left hand, uh, I got one of my fingers. And when they were about to move on to my other finger, the superintendent finally showed up and asked what the hell was going on. And I heard, I heard Goldleaf say that, uh, that they found drugs on me, that I attacked them. And uh, I, I understood all this and I told them in their own language, but Goldleaf's lying. I said, he's, he's, they're, they're stealing money from me. They're starving, I'm gonna die. And he comes over and he sees me and I'm on the ground and he says, you understand or do? I said, yes, sir. And he says, what happened? So I get up and I'm holding my hand because my hand, my fingers are all fucking jacked. I tell him that uh, Goldleaf wanted 500 rupees from me, and I, I told him to go to hell. And then uh, I told him uh, I told him about some of the the beatings I'd taken because uh, for money and how they'd steal it from me, and he uh, he be he believed me. He believed me, and he fired Goldleaf right there on the spot. Hello. Hello. Hi. Is this Rasmic? Oh, hi, my name is Jamie Lynn. How are you? Very good, thank you. Good. Um, I'm a documentary filmmaker. I'm uh, making a documentary about Eric Ade. Who's, who's Eric? Eric Ade. D no, does that, that, that name is not familiar to you? No, no. You know what? Days of Rasmik is the same last name as mine. And uh, we did have few problems. I mean, even we went court for that. He was involved with the drug, you know, smuggling people and, you know, lots of other things. Many, many co collection agencies, even like I said, I been su subpoenaed from the court and, you know, for that. And oh, wow. And I go to court and, you know, show them I'm not the person. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so... Yeah, his name is same as mine. His last name is same as mine. Yeah. Well, I'm so sorry because you probably have to, you know, been dealing with this mix-up for years. So I oh, I, yeah. I appreciate uh, you taking my call and calling me back. Good we, luck. <laughs> thank you so much. Have a great night. All right. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I started cleaning up the place, you know, because I figured, hey, if I'm gonna be here, then I might as well make it look nice. And uh, so I started fixing this ugly yard up and and it was uh, one afternoon that I was working uh, just behind our cells. And there's this long path with like all these weeds and, and a couple of trees that I have been growing and, and just random flowers along a border that I had made. I see this, this guy I'd never seen before hop the wall and he comes, walking right up to me but not really walking at first but he, get, he gets up and starts doing he does a little jog i don't understand what's going on but as he's running towards me i can see in his eyes that there's something wrong here so i stand up 
And I get ready, and sure enough, he's got a knife in his hand and tries to stab me, so I hit him with a rock. And I tried to grab the knife out of his hand while we were, while we were uh, re wrestling for it, but he had it out. And I didn't want him to, like, I, was I couldn't get it because it was on the other side of him. And I didn't want him to stab me in the leg. It's the first thing I thought because he was swinging it around everywhere, and I was just using his body to block me from his own swinging arm. And uh, I only meant to throw him on the ground, but I ended up, uh, I, sna um, I, s I snapped his neck and, uh, you know, I, uh, he went limp and uh, I got him off of me. And uh, I, uh, I just killed a man in, uh, in jail. I didn't, uh, I didn't, uh, I never thought I'd have to do something like that. But uh, I just, uh, I, 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 I got away from him and I was crying. And I couldn't control my crying because uh, I wasn't crying because I, I was, I was just, you know, you go to jail for shit. <laughs> For one thing, and now this is way worse. When that year came to an end, and I just celebrated being in jail two years, uh, one of my jobs in jail was I was a teacher. But because I was a teacher, I could also get back over to death row to go see my friend Murad. I get a call over to, uh, to death row. Uh, I get there and Murad had this whole meal planned out for us. There was, there was chicken there, there was sweet dishes. Uh, there was all these little side dishes. And I thought, all right, cool, what's the occasion? Because, you know, whenever there's a holiday, there's always food festivities and everything or a birthday. Um, no occasion, just wanted to have a meal with me. And this was a great meal, I always say. Outside jail, this is just a normal meal, but inside Pakistan, this is a five-star meal. This is the kind of meal you'd have to bribe a lot of guards to make happen. Nothing was spicy. I hated spicy food. Murad knew that. Nothing was spicy. And we ate all the food. We shot the shit. We played poker. We played chess. We talked about life. I hung out that day. I hung out a long time that day. I hung out forever. When I got called back to my cell, um, later on that day, I... I told Murad, hey, I'll see you next week. He says, inshallah. Inshallah means God willing. It's a normal saying in Pakistan or in Urdu. It's, hey, you'll get out of here soon, inshallah. Or hopefully uh, the judge will go easy on you soon, inshallah. I'll see you next week, inshallah. And uh, the next morning he, uh, he was hung. Um, He'd, uh, he shared his last meal with me. He had it prepared so that I'd enjoy it, not him. And, uh, and he didn't tell me. One day, Joey Paul Jensen knocks on my office, and she said, you know, Sherry, I have this gentleman. His name is Scott. I forget his last name. But I have this gentleman who went to school with the son of the president of Pakistan, Perez Musharraf's son. Uh, Mr. Musharraf says to me, so what is it you would like me to do? And I said, I have here a letter that I would ask that you present to your brother, you know, President Perez Musharraf, asking for clemency for my son. She was using every resource she had just personally, socially, and financially, and that wasn't an endless pipeline. And so it was fortuitous that I knew this person that somehow was connected in ways that I couldn't even describe because 
I don't even know if he could even say what all of those connections actually are. My foundation, the Richardson Center for Global Engagement, specializes in trying to secure the release of uh, prisoners of conscience, uh, prisoners of war from uh, foreign countries, from dictatorships. Uh, we've been doing this for close to 20 years throughout my career. And, and I felt that somehow somebody had to speak up for this young man. The government was trying to help, but we have a lot of interest with Pakistan. We're allies, we have military, interests, intelligence interests. At the time, we wanted Pakistan's help in defeating the Taliban. So there were a lot of security interests, and sometimes the U.S. government doesn't want to get those interests in jeopardy uh, by, like, pressing on the release of a young man like Aaron. And I felt that uh, I still had relationships in Pakistan. I'd been there many times. I knew high-level people. They had actually helped me when I was UN ambassador have a dialogue with the Taliban that resulted in a short-term uh, ceasefire and some advancements. Uh, and so I knew enough of the leaders there that uh, I got involved. I get a visit from my lawyer and, and tell him, okay, we're gonna go, we're gonna go to the courts and uh, we're gonna see what we can do as we were um, coming out of two cell and up the path, one of the deputy superintendents and all his number guards started praying for me. And literally as I was walking up to the front of the prison, all the, you know, the gardeners and different prisoners were, you know, in unison, just giving me a nice little blessing. And I thought to myself, wow, this is, this, this changed. When I came in here, I came in swinging. And uh, here I was with potentially good news about to be given to me, I might be leaving soon, and here's everyone whose attitudes had all changed towards me. It felt, it felt good. I, uh, I appreciated that, but also, I didn't want to get my hopes up. I, I kept telling myself, Eric, if you, if it's bad news and you have to end up being here for seven years, you can do it. Everything's gonna be fine. You know, you've made a good life for yourself here. It, and I always remind myself, it could always be worse. I just didn't want to get my hopes up, and as I went into the prison, went into the the front office and down a hallway, I started questioning myself. What if, though? What if? What if? And I go around the corner towards the superintendent's office, and it was the prison doctor who came around the corner, and he was crying. He says, "Eric, you're going home." And I was like, "Thank you." Sherry, what's going through your head right now? Oh, I'm, I'm just trying to hold myself together. I can't believe it's really happening. Get home, guys. Get home. Get home. Get home. Get home. I'm right. Eric, how does it feel to be home? It's, uh, it's new. It's wonderful. It's the best Christmas gift I could ever ask for. That moment when I saw him, it was uh, it was emotional. Usually, I don't cry. <laughs> I'm a military guy. I don't. But it was it was rough. So when I saw him, I just cried. I was overcome. You know, um, we were just completely. <sighs> Our breath was taken away to be able to see him in person. But I understand that Ray Kazarian is out there still. If um, Ray was sitting here right now, honestly, I, 
I, I don't even know what I would say. I'd be absolutely disgusted. Um, I think he's a horrible person that um, was never punished for what he did to Eric. I think he's heartless. Um, and I think it's really sad that he got away with what he got away with. And he hurt a lot of people. I hope that God puts him straight into the uh, Hades. I was so mad. I told his mom, oh my God, I just don't want to see this guy. I just don't want to see him. Have you ever seen him since? Oh my God, never, ever. I saw him from the gym before the incident. After that, never. If I saw that guy, I would let him go. With one choke, I'll be honest with you, until they take me to jail. Because he was sneaky, and he was an asshole. From the beginning, he was planning to take that person to prison. Lorna and I, we found, the private investigator found the information, and so we, we called him, and we spoke to, what was it, Lorna, his girlfriend or something, his wife? She said she would take the number and call back. So then I missed an 818 number, so then I call him back, and he, everything he said, I, I have it all recorded, was to me legitimize that this definitely isn't him and that the PI, like, this is, this is who they found before. Um, and so I'm like, ugh, another, you know, failed lead, like a dead end, of course. And then remember how we found the LinkedIn page? Yeah. So I go to LinkedIn and I wrote him, let me see. I'm making a documentary about Eric Ade and I'd like to interview you. I would like to give you a chance to tell your side of the story. I can be reached at. I look forward to hearing for you, from you and thank you for your time. So then, shortly after, I keep, you know, checking the message because you can see when it's seen, and then I see that it's seen, and now his profile is not available, and he's completely deleted himself from LinkedIn, and so he clearly read my message, and he does not want to be found, and he doesn't want to be part of this. And the reason he doesn't want to be part of this is because the judgment the civil suit that Eric had against him, he owes him, he owes him money, so he wants to stay hidden. And then what, what happened moving forward, you know, into present day? Did you guys maintain a friendship or try to have a relationship? We tried shortly, you know, we tried when he got home. Um, it was hard. I don't think I fully could be the person that he needed me to be at that point. We had these ideas in our head of who the other person was. And I felt like I could never live up to the pedestal that he kind of put me on. And so after he got home, we just ended up fighting. Because <laughs> I didn't feel like I could be, I didn't feel like I was giving him what he needed. And I didn't feel like I was getting what I needed. My uh, first couple of days back, I, I wanted to get my life back together. My high school football coach, he let me use his car. I asked him, I told him I'd get it back to him uh, that night. He goes, just, just get your life back. So he let me borrow, um, he let me borrow his car that week. And Simo took me out for lunch, he paid for it. I had no money in my pocket, nothing. And when I was getting back in my car, Simo took a hundred bucks out and he tried to give it to me. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't, he's, I, would, I didn't want to take it. I wouldn't have taken it either, but he was such a massive man. He was able to put it in my pocket and force me into my car and close the door. And I needed that $100. He, he knew I needed it. But I saw a sign off the freeway that said, uh, Hollywood Park Casino. So I thought, you know what, I'll kill some time just until traffic winds down and I'll see what I can do with $50. I stay there all night and I leave with $2,600 in my pocket. Poker just happened to be my life raft to get my life back together. He bounced back really quickly because he made that a determination for himself. It was a traumatic experience while he was there, but 
Now he's making the best of a bad situation. I'm just like really inspired by him um, that someone can go through that and still come back the way that he has. To see him come back and pick up where he left off like it was nothing. And you know, that's admirable. You know, I have the utmost respect for him and love for him. Eric usually puts on a stunt happy hour every Thursday night out here. This guy is like has the heart of a diamond and gold combined. Extremely friendly, extremely kind. Made sure to introduce me to everybody. And um, the kind of stunt work I do, normally don't, I don't interact with guys that look like him. So I was a little nervous coming in. And he was just, he's a really friendly guy. And I've come to these things ever since. And, built up a real good friendship with the guy. He's, he's awesome. You would never know something that traumatic happened to him. And he's definitely not a bitter guy, uh, quite the opposite. Outgoing, non-filtered, and just, he's awesome. Yeah, you couldn't see that history off of him at all. So, I don't know how he does that. That makes him a Superman, in my opinion. When he told me this story, I was thinking, there's no way, that can't be real, and you're normal, you know? when you go through that kind of devastation in your life, mental torture and physical torture, the combination of two, that's hard to put behind you. And he's definitely put it behind him for sure. I definitely would say Eric is a lot stronger having gone through what he's been through. I, I do know that Eric gets a lot of people that say negative things as well. Um, a lot of people will just randomly send him messages on Facebook or Twitter and say horrible things, um, that they don't believe him, that he's a liar, and which I find horrific. I don't know how you could <laughs> just say that to somebody you don't know. For the people out there, you know, they, they will say, oh, come on, maybe he knows about it. He's not stupid. Trust me. A zillion percent he doesn't know. You know, here's the reality of it. If he knew what he was doing, he would just say it. At this point, he's back here. There's nothing he can lose, you know? And, and Eric's that guy where he just, he may be a lot of things, but he's not a liar. Remember, this is a man of conscience. He showed while he was in prison that he wasn't going to plead guilty, uh, even though it meant spending more years in prison. He was a man of conscience who believed he didn't do anything wrong. He was duped, and that happens. So, you know, lay off, be compassionate. He doesn't let the negative in his life deter him from his dreams or his goals. This is just chapter two or three of like a 12 chapter book with Eric. You know, there's gonna be, you know, some monumental things that will happen with him in the future. And I think they're all gonna be good. When bad things happen to me, if anything, I, I just kind of compare it to what happened to me in Pakistan. Everything from this point on in my life is nowhere near going to be where Pakistan was. It's made, Pakistan has made everything else in life much more tolerable. I think I've changed a lot actually since I've been with Eric, um, for the good. Um, I think I've learned to relax a little bit more. Um, I think I've learned to laugh a little bit more. Um, I definitely learned that you can get through anything. <laughs> um, I think you're, you're with the person you're supposed to be with when you're a better person, and I think he's done that for me, for sure. If you could use five adjectives to describe him, what would they be? Oh my gosh. Crazy, <laughs> but in a good way. Loyal. Very straightforward. Honest. Driven, all caps. Resourceful. Hysterical. <laughs> He loves to laugh. He swears like a sailor. Awesome. He's always been a class act to me. He is an amazing guy. Very smart person, too. He treats everybody the same. He has a huge heart. Definitely warm-hearted. He's just, he cares about other people. That he's a caring person, for sure. He is truly a man of integrity. Unforgettable. Unforgettable. You know, I... Before I went to jail, I was selfish. I was selfish. I didn't appreciate anything. I always, I always wanted something 
that was just outside of my reach. I never, I never acknowledged what I had. If I got a co-star, I'd be like, I want a guest star. If I got a guest star, man, I wish I had a reoccurring. Nothing was ever good enough in my eyes. But when I got out of prison, I had nothing on me except the clothes on my back. And I felt richer than anything. I felt, I felt, I mean, God, it was just, it was amazing. That, that drive back to the city was just awesome. The views, the music on the radio. And when I, uh, when I got home, the things that I really, that really stood out to me were, well, well English is great. People that speak your language, that's awesome. Ice water. Ice water is gold. I love ice water. You know, a standing uh, shower, uh, a toilet. I mean, this is this stuff's awesome. Pillows, blankets, a real bed. Being able to run out into a cold night and run back into a, a warm room. Friends, picking up the phone and talking to someone you haven't spoken to in years and just catching up like no time's passed. A friendly smile, a song that reminds you of someone that you know, you never could forget about jokes, food, lots of food. Everything, everything in our world is amazing in its own way. And it's something that I would never have acknowledged had I not gone to jail. This year I've, uh, I've opened up uh, uh, my eighth restaurant. Did stunts on uh, Dunkirk with Chris Nolan, and uh, got off, the, got to work with Bill Paxton on Training Day, and uh, did my third episode of Scorpion. So I have a pretty good life. I, 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 I don't have too many complaints nowadays. I take care of me. I, I don't let people take advantage of me, and I play poker, and I act, and do stunts, and I, I travel the world with my girlfriend, and I do pretty well. I'm pretty thankful for what I do have, and I just want to get through this life as simply as possible and be as happy as I can. It's a brand new day, the sun is shining. It's a brand new day For the first time in such a long, long time I know I'll be okay It's a brand 